Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. A few months ago I told you about Ichio Higuchi and her short stories. Today I want to focus on another great modern female Japanese author that I believe deserves a lot more attention than she gets. I have just finished reading Ukigumo or Floating Clouds by Fumiko Hayashi and I do not hesitate to call this one of the masterpieces of 20th century Japanese literature. This is the kind of novel that if you like Osamu Dasai, if you like Junichiro Tanisaki or Yukio Mishima, you should definitely check out. But let me tell you a little bit about the author and then a little bit about this novel in particular and I will just let you decide if you want to do that. So first of all, let's talk about the author, Fumiko Hayashi. She was born in 1904 and Two things that happened throughout her life, two constants, I would say, unfortunately, were uncertainty and poverty. She tried her hand at all kinds of jobs throughout her life. She was a maid, she was a waitress, she was a sales girl, she was a factory worker, a professional letter writer. It seems that it's one of those cases where you name it, she did it. She was also a voracious reader, and this is from a very early age libraries were really instrumental in shaping her as a writer and also as a person of course it was in 1930 though that her literary breakthrough came and it was with a work that became almost an instant bestseller and that is the diary of a vagabond i am showing you the spanish edition because unfortunately there is no english translation of the complete diary of a vagabond at least not yet we can hope that this will become available soon in the winter of 1949, she contracted pneumonia, and a couple of years after that, in 1951, she died, unfortunately, at the age of only 45 years old. And you know who was the chief mourner at her funeral? It was my friend and my favorite Japanese author, Yasunari Kawabata. So I think it's fitting, really, because Kawabata has a text, a little short story that he wrote once titled The Master of Funerals. He was acquainted with death, I guess you could say, from a very early age. So I think it's only fitting that he was the chief mourner at the funeral of this great uh, Japanese author who died at such an early age. I want to tell you a little bit about my experience of the work of Fumiko Hayashi. And the first... Uh, book that I got by her is this one that I showed you before, The Diary of a Vagabond. I decided some years ago to treat myself because this is published by a publisher known as Satori. The editions are really beautiful, but when you add you know, the shipping to, to the US, they become really expensive. So unfortunately, I have to say that that is the only book that I have by that publisher. It's a publisher that works in Spain. So when you consider, once again, the, the shipping, you know, it, it becomes really expensive. There are many, many great books in their catalog, and I wish I could have more of them, but I'm working on it. You know, this is the first one that I have. So I really liked The Diary of a Vagabond. It's really a shattering and heartbreaking read, so I wanted to read more by her. As a result, the next book that I got was Le Cier Brun. Uh, brown Eyes, that's the translation of that title. This one is in French and it is also not available in English. So I got this one, I haven't read it yet. I will one of these days, but it's in French so it will take me a little bit more uh, time to, to read it. It was a couple of months ago that I got finally a copy of one of her books in English translation, which is once again the uh, Floating Clouds novel. I was primarily inspired to read this because of my enthusiasm with Ichio Higuchi that I uh, talked about recently. Before all this, however, so if, I, if I'm to be honest here, the first experience of the work of Fumiko Hayashi that I had came from this book, the Oxford book of Japanese short stories. And in this one you're going to find a short story by her titled The Accordion and the Fish Town. It's a story about poverty, among other things, so it's something that could actually have come out of the diary of a vagabond. As a matter of fact, I had thought that the accordion and the fish tone was actually a, kind of an excerpt from the diary of a vagabond, but actually it is not. Okay, It's an independent work. So let's talk about floating clouds now. Okay, This novel was serialized. Okay, It started to be published in 1949 and it was a couple of years 
that it was serialized until 1951. And I was thinking about this, okay, 1949. If you think about it, the late 40s were like really amazing for Japanese literature. The year before that, 1948, was the year that saw the publication of No Longer Human by Osamu Dasai and Snow Country by Yasunari Kawabata. And in a way, I would say that Floating Clouds is kind of like a combination of those two. I related to No Longer Human because of the themes and, and the darkness of the novel, and I related to Snow Country because of maybe the plot and the story of these star-crossed lovers, which is something that you can also find in Floating Clouds. And also, 1948 was the year that saw the publication of what great novel that I have just talked about a couple of months ago, maybe, or some weeks ago? Yes, my friend, the Makioka Sisters. 1949, when Floating Clouds started to be published, was also the year that Confessions of a Mask by Yukio Mishima was published. So once again, you know, I think that proves my point. The late 40s were just amazing. For enthusiasts of Japanese literature, the title, especially the title in Japanese, Ukigumo, is going to ring a bell. Ukigumo is the exact same title as that of a novel by Shimei Futabatei that is considered to be the first modern Japanese novel. So this is not coincidence, I believe. The topic is very different. Futabate's novel is about a young man from the provinces who moves to the city. He has traditional values and he realizes that these traditional values are not helping him in the city. And he is contrasted in that novel with the character of this opportunist guy who is only, you know, concerned with success. So you have that contrast there, you know, the province and the city traditional values versus the modern rat race, I guess you could say. So no connection in the plot, right? But Futabate's novel was just a model for an entire generation of Japanese writers. That's why it's considered to be the first modern Japanese novel. And another connection here is that, like Futabate, Fumiko Hayashi learned a lot from Russian writers especially, for example, from Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky is mentioned in this novel, Floating Clouds, especially demons, or the possessed, however you want to call it. But there are also allusions to uh, crime and punishment. So you see what I'm saying, it's that type of connection. Now, let's talk about Hayashi's Floating Clouds. This novel is highly autobiographical, that's the first thing and the most evident thing that you can say. And the interesting thing is that it is even more autobiographical than The Diary of a Vagabond. It is a really, really personal account. This is, uh, let me tell you how long exactly, we are talking about 303 pages and it is divided into 67 chapters that are very, very brief. So it's very easy to read because it has that episodic quality to it. Even though there is a plot, these are not independent episodes that we are presented with. But because the chapters are so brief, it, it makes for a really quick read. The English translation is by uh, Lane Dunlop, who has translated many great works of Japanese literature, and let me tell you, it just reads beautifully. Okay, I, I really enjoyed the reading experience without being you know, familiar with the original text in Japanese. There was one little thing that I was concerned about, and if you look at the beginning, there's a note to the reader, and it says, where necessary, slight abridgment of the original text has been made. So I was like, okay, where necessary? Who decides when it is necessary to abridge a text? And what does slight abridgment mean? How slight are we talking about? Now, something to consider here. Fumiko Hayashi is not concise. Okay, she's not wordy, but she's not concise either. So that is something that we have to keep in mind when we read her. And I was like, okay, I can understand that. On the other hand, I'm not really a very big fan of abridgment. That's an understatement, okay? Uh, I think that works should be translated complete and then, you know, let the reader decide uh, if they want to skip uh, parts of them or not. But I'm going to say that I still enjoyed the text and I am still very happy that it is available in English in the first place. I would like to compare it maybe to the Spanish edition from Satori Publishers to see maybe if the Spanish edition is complete or not. I'm wondering about that. If it was a direct translation from the Japanese, it probably was. So that's one thing that I would like to have, you know, the experience of reading this novel in Spanish. And actually speaking of uh, the novel in Spanish, I wanted to recommend to you a video by my friend Katia. She actually read, um, you know, Floating Clouds in Spanish, Nubes Flotantes. 
and she uh, talked about it in one of her videos so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna link that video in the description to this one check it out check out her channel it's in Spanish but as you know you can do auto translate so that's always an option for you and I highly recommend all of her of her videos really but this one in particular since she shares with us her ideas about floating clouds also so let's talk about the plot okay that is something that we uh, tend to care about right this is a story of a young woman named Yukiko and as the novel begins she is returning to Japan after some years of living abroad and working as a typist in French Indochina so that is her situation in terms of work and in terms of what she's doing at the moment but emotionally her issue is this she is torn between two men and the two men happen to be married so we already have a bit of a problem here one of the men is Iba who actually took advantage of her before she left Japan and took advantage is probably a, a light way of saying it she actually he actually abused her and that was in fact part of the reason why she decided to leave Japan in the first place so that is one of the men in her life and the other one more importantly is Tomioka whom she met abroad in French Indochina while they were working there because they were co-workers and they were just uh, drawn to each other so for Yukiko these years that she spent abroad are a bit of an idyllic time a bit of a golden age you know this time when she developed this relationship with this man named Tomioka and when she goes back to Japan what she wants to do is she hopes that she will be able to recreate this golden age and for that reason it is that she tries to reconnect with Tomioka now trying to relive the past uh, that sounds familiar doesn't it do you think this is gonna be a happy story no it's not gonna be a happy story we have seen that many times in literature and actually also in real life unfortunately and that just doesn't end uh, happily okay trying to recreate or to bring back the past I want to tell you a little bit now about the mode and the tone of the novel. This is very easy to discuss actually because the mode that we have here, Floating Clouds, is just an excellent example of realist fiction. That's just plain and simple, very straightforward. It captures the daily struggles of ordinary people, if there is such a thing, and the overall psychology of these people in post-war Japan. So the setting there in, in terms of the time and the space is like really good and, and really attractive to me at least. Now because of that, given all of those things, this is a very dark story. That's why I was saying, you know, if you like Dasai, this is the kind of thing that you'll enjoy. The characters are just uh, drawn to each other even though they are not good for each other. It's kind of a magnetism, it's kind of an impulse, almost like what you have in something like Wuthering Heights. And I was thinking as I read it of something that Dante Gabriel Rossetti said about Wuthering Heights when he was done reading it, and of course I am paraphrasing here, but he said, the names of the places and the names of the people are in English, but the story actually takes place in hell. And you could totally say the same thing about floating clouds. That's the impression that I got of these characters and the things that they were going through. So this is really the story of a toxic relationship. It's a sick relationship. They don't even like each other. And this is clear from the comments that we get as we read the story. So you ask yourself, why? Why are they drawn together? It's just animal magnetism okay it's just physical for the most part at one point Yugiko says that she uh, misses or, or she needs the smell of this man it's really physical you could also say well maybe it's just that misery likes company right and unfortunately these things happen in, in real life you know so it's a very real situation that we have in this novel so once again it's the kind of thing for uh, Dasai fans so if you're one definitely check out floating clouds because I believe you're going to enjoy it there are many important themes in the novel and many themes that are really heavy, I would say, in, in a good way, right? For example, the first one that stood out to me, and I think this is probably obvious, right, is this, the theme of uprootedness. This, these characters who have been taken out of their natural environment, if, if you could call it that, right? We have characters who have come back to Japan and with all that that implies, there is that novel by Thomas Wolfe that is titled You Can't Go Home Again. You can't go down to the same river twice because of course the home has changed you know but also you have changed uh, in being outside of that place and I wanted to read you a little bit here from the novel that kind of illustrates that aspect right there this is on page 241 if you have this edition of the novel right here 
And um, this is something that we have from Tomioka. He says, since the end of the war, like everybody else, I've lost the power to decide things for myself. Nowadays, everybody just tries to do whatever society gives us to do. Even if you and I were to try to pursue the dreams of the past and to live it up on the money you have for a while, it wouldn't do any good. We're like floating weeds with no roots. I don't think it will work out for us. This idea of floating weeds with no roots. Floating weeds reminded me of that Yasujiro Osu film that I have right here, I believe. It's like a really, really good film. I don't think there's a relation in the in the story itself or anything like that, but uh, that's definitely a film that I recommend to you outside of, of this uh, experience of reading Floating Clouds. So you have the theme of uprootedness. You also have a very um, very good sense, right, and a very strong sense, rather, of defeat. Because we are talking about post-war Japan. I mean, this is kind of a given. We don't even really need to mention it. There's a sense of lost humanity. This is how the characters feel. They feel as if they have lost their humanity. And of course, I made the connection right there with the concept of being no longer human, as Dasai put it. There's another thing that I wanted to read you right here. This one is on page 279. Tomioka felt as if during the past several years of his worldwide war, he had lost his humanity somewhere. It seemed to him that the person with his name had become someone whose heart was empty. He might look like a living person, but in fact, he was just making the gestures. There's this concept of just going through the motions, you know, people are almost automatons, no, no sense of humanity, no sense of being able to make choices, which is basically one of the things that make us human. So we have uprootedness, we have defeats, we have poverty, which as I said before is something that Fumiko Hayashi just knew uh, firsthand because she experienced it. You're gonna see that in the novel Yukiko has no place to stay. She's always wandering, you know, looking for a place, a vagabond, we can go back, of course, to the title, Diary of a Vagabond. Another really cool theme that you'll find here is just the abyss that exists between men and women and their perspectives, which is something that is present also in the work of Yukio Mishima. So that's one of the reasons why I mentioned him before. Hayashi emphasizes just how difficult it is for men and women to connect and to communicate. But a really cool thing about this novel is that you don't just get the perspective of the female character. Yukiko is definitely the protagonist, but we also hear a lot about Tomioka's perspective. She's really good at getting inside the minds of these characters. That's probably something that she learned among other people from Dostoevsky. And she is great at giving us both the man's perspective and the woman's perspective. The woman's perspective, of course, more prominently. And one final thing that I really liked was the portrayal of religion in this film. I, I wouldn't say I particularly liked it or it wasn't particularly a positive thing, but I just like the fact that she addressed this issue. In Floating Clouds, religion is basically portrayed as a scam. It's just something that some people use in order to take advantage of people who are desperate, which is a very, I guess, human uh, thing to do. This idea that when people are suffering, there are also other people there just ready to take advantage of them. And in this case, religion is one way that they do that, unfortunately. There's a film adaptation of Floating Clouds. I watched it and I enjoyed it very much. It's from 1955 by Mikio Naruse, who is, if you ask me, one of the great uh, Japanese filmmakers. He does not get as much attention as Akira Kurosawa or Yasujiro Osu or even Kenji Misoguchi, but he is really, really good. And one thing that I was struck by as I watched the movie was uh, just how faithful an adaptation it is of the novel, okay? It was perfect for Naruse because he didn't really have to do much here to the text. He didn't have to alter the text that much. It goes just really well with his concept of these strong women who suffer a lot. He really likes to explore the plight of women, but the interesting thing about him is that these women that he portrays in movies, for example, as when a woman ascends the stairs, are very strong female characters, but they still suffer. So it, it makes it even worse. It makes it even more difficult for us to accept what happens to them, because even strong women are crushed by, by life and by the system and by the situation in his movies. The uh, character of Yukiko is played by Hideko Takamine, one of my favorite Japanese actresses, and I would say that in this movie her performance is just at the same level with her best work, just such as, you know, the one that I just mentioned, When a Woman Ascends the Stairs, another movie that I have somewhere here. 
um, 24 Eyes, another great classic by her. And then Tomioka, on the other hand, is played by Masayuki Mori, who was in Rashomon, of course, Ugetsu, and so many other movies. And another thing that I liked about this movie was that it features a rather early performance by Mariko Okada. So uh, she was also, you know, famous for working with Yasujiro Osu, among others. And she plays Seiko, who is the love interest of Tomioka at some point in the novel. Tomioka is a bit of a womanizer, to put it mildly. And that's part of the problem with this couple that we have here, right? We have this woman who is drawn to this man who is drawn to all of these other women, right? They're almost a couple like the type of couple that you find in Hemingway, that there's just no way that they can ever find happiness together. One really, really good touch that I liked in the movie, and you can see this throughout, it's kind of like a recurring scene or a recurring uh, theme, is the idea that you see these characters walking around. They're just drifting. And that's how the filmmaker conveys this idea that these are floating clouds, right? The floating clouds are human beings who just seem to move, you know, according to the whim of the, of the wind, just wherever the wind takes them. And eventually, of course, they vanish right and, and they disappear so it's a metaphor of the impermanence of the human condition so i think that works very well in the novel of course and also in the movie and a little bit of trivia here this movie floating clouds by mikio naruse 1955 was voted in a very important poll as the third most important or the third best japanese movie of all time after uh, Seven Samurai by Akira Kurosawa and Tokyo Story. So I thought that was very interesting. Seven Samurai, you have the epic film. Tokyo Story is a film that is just deeply sad. And I would say Floating Clouds is the dark movie of those three. So they are highlighting these very important elements of Japanese cinema, and I think that's very good. I don't know if this is the choice that I would have had as a third best. You know, I would probably have gone with something by Misoguchi, like maybe Ugetsu, probably. But I still like that choice. You know, I think that it's a very good movie because it is a very good novel. So the movie says good things not only about the director, right, Mikio Naruse, but also about Fumiko Hayashi as a storyteller. Because you may have a novel in which the author is not a particularly good storyteller and you still have the novel and people still read it, right? There are many examples of great writers who are not necessarily great storytellers. In film, on the other hand, if you don't have a good story, if you don't have a good visual storyteller, you just don't have that much of a film, right? And we have seen many examples of that. So I thought that was a point that I wanted to share with you about the movie also. So the bottom line here, I think you should really read Floating Clouds. It's a really good story. It's a dark story, compelling. The characters are interesting and they are real human beings. And the setting is also very good, you know, both in terms of where it happens and at what time it happens. So really, it's like, what more could we ask of a story? This is definitely a novel that is worth our attention. I would say if you're in doubt, right, whether to check out the work of Fumiko Hayashi or not, the first thing that I would do is I would try to get my hands on that short story that I showed you from this collection, the Oxford Book of of Japanese short stories, The Accordion and The Fishtown. I think if you read that story and you like it, then you definitely have an author here that you may enjoy. But just be aware that Floating Clouds is really her masterpiece in terms of all of the books that she wrote. I would say that I enjoyed it more even than I did The Diary of a Vagabond, because as you can tell, you know, the diary is a very flexible structure, but because of that also, it's sometimes a very random type of structure to have. I can read The Diary of a Vagabond more as autobiography, but as a novel, as a structured novel with plot and everything, that would be Floating Clouds. Floating Clouds is definitely her best work. I'm going to continue to read Fumiko Hayashi, definitely. I have this book right here that I showed you before, Brown Eyes. This was also made into a movie by Mikio Naruse. Okay, he directed at least six films based on the works of Fumiko Hayashi, and this was one of them. They changed the title for the film. The film is titled The Wife, whereas here we have Brown Eyes, and the original title is Chairo no Me. So there's a little bit of a change there. But once again, I'm going to read this, and I'll try to share my ideas with you, but it may take me a while because this is a rather long novel. It's 300 pages and it's in French, so that's going to take a little bit of time. It's definitely worth the effort, I believe, but, you know, it, it'll take me a few months, probably, to get there. So, uh, Hayashi is just brilliant, okay? I, I put her on the same shelf as Natsume Soseki, Osamu Dasai, 
Yukio Mishima, Yasunari Kawabata, Junichiro Tanizaki, and all of those great, great authors of Japanese literature. I wanted to give her a space here in my corner, just as I did for Ichio Higuchi, because I believe that there are certain authors that sometimes get pushed aside, or they are eclipsed by those other great names. But I still believe we should check them out and have the experience of reading them. So do you have any questions, comments, recommendations, recipes? Just let me know. Those were my two cents on Floating Clouds, a great realist novel by Fumiko Hayashi. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for stopping by. Have a wonderful day.